talking about. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, you <laughs> Sorry, I should have said I'm going to hit go live now. Um, welcome, welcome, everybody. We're talking about how nice it is when you can hear the birds singing, and I totally am mm -hmm. and feel that too. I'm so grateful to have Cecile Armstrong here with us this morning, and. Let me tell you, folks, this is going to be a powerful session, and I'm so glad for everyone who is tuning in because Cecile's wisdom and grace and humor and intelligence and and just beingness is completely revolutionary and so healing, and I'm so grateful. You. To Yay. <laughs> Yay, so you are in for a treat, people. Put, if you're joining us, please note in the in the comments. We would love to see who's here, um, where you're joining us from. Uh, I'm Karen Fleshman, founder of Racy Conversations and of Collect Our Cousins, engaging white people in the struggle for full democracy weekly LinkedIn live series. I created Collect Our Cousins to help white Americans like me become more effective in our conversations with white people in our lives, to help us build an embodied anti-racist white culture, in the words of Resma Menachem. I'm featuring the people who inspire and teach me the most, like Cecile. <laughs> white Americans, the battle for democracy will not be won in courtrooms or in the streets. It must be won in white living rooms, at our neighborhood meetings, PTA meetings, in board rooms, um, school board meetings. As an anti-racist, collect the end of my to-do list. Oh, I'll get to that next month. Mm -hmm. But I want to encourage everyone here to make a list of your friends and family you will collect this year. Pick up the phone and call them or go see them in person. 21 million Americans, largely white, believe that Donald Trump is the legitimate president and political violence may be necessary to restore him to office. And we are front line in, in um, changing this. So thank you so much for joining us, Cecile. I'm so grateful to you. Thanks for inviting me. I was happy when you reached out. <laughs> Yay! Yes, it's Mental <laughs> Health Awareness Month. I'm like, who are the most mentally <laughs> healthy people I can feature? People who make my mental health improve dramatically. And yes, I was grateful that you could be here. Could you share a little bit about yourself and your work? Yeah. Hold on. I'm trying to get my get my laptop straight. It keeps bouncing around. No worries. No worries. Okay. Um, like you said, I'm Cecile Armstrong. I'm a self-care and social justice facilitator. Um, so what I'm the founder of Inspounded by Indigo. It's an online membership community dedicated to helping people, teaching people how to make equity a habit and using self-care and joy. Um, teaching people about this kind of, teaching people about American history, talking about racism is it's a downer. People get scared. They run away from it. And so um, I like to make sure that everyone is embodied and that we're bringing joy for learning the facts, learning the hard things so that we can do better. And in the community, we follow a four step process. We follow my four pillars. Every week we work on one pillar. The first one is self care because healing is a form of protest. Our, our society is set up to keep us busy and distracted and frustrated. And so when you take the time to get in your body and learn how to do self-care, that is a form of protest. And getting in your body also helps people let down their defenses so they can learn. All right, and then step two is know your facts. That's how you undo myths and lies by learning the facts, using source documents and finding out the truth about our history. Step three is undoing the work, undoing what we've learned and lived about race, equality, and privilege. Um, most of us have learned 
most of us have learned myths and lies. <laughs> and so, you know, once you once you get in your body so that you can actually have the capacity to take in hard information and then you learn the facts, then the next step is to go out and undo something. You've either, you're either undoing beliefs or you're out in the world making a difference for somebody else by sharing what you know and acting on what you learned. And then step four is to rest and celebrate. You got to rest so you don't get burnt out. Too many activists just go, 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 and they're getting sick and they're dying. And so we build rest into the program. And then the celebration, if you wait until you reach your main goal, if you wait until racism is is no longer exists or until homophobia is extinct or until misogyny is gone, you are never going to celebrate. And so we celebrate our small wins. You know, we celebrate every time we try, even if we mess up. We celebrate when it goes well. <laughs> you know, we celebrate when we mess up and then we correct ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, in the right way. We celebrate everything. And so it's the four pillars. It's self-care, know your facts, undo the work, arrest and celebrate. And by going through these steps every month, I'm helping my members to make equity a habit. Because we talk about racism, we talk about all different kinds of oppression because it's all the same thing, just targeted at different people. But by going through the steps, you're learning how to make it a habit and you're doing it in community. So it's not like you're by yourself. It's easier to do in a group. Mm, I love everything you just said. And I love how it's a continuous cycle between mm -hmm. these four things and creating that pattern. That yeah. The foundation of culture is mm -hmm. a repeated pattern yep. of behavior. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, we're trying in the in the group. I really want to help people just shift their norm. Stop being afraid of hard things. Stop being mm -hmm. afraid to speak up and and recognize that for most people, for most white people especially, um, the things that they fear are not the same. It's not like you're going to have bodily harm. It's not like somebody's going to kill you for expressing a difference of opinion. You have more leeway to say the things and repeat the things that Black people and other people of color and other people in marginalized groups are saying, and people will listen to you because you look like them. 100%. I am living proof that you can <laughs> say those things and survive and right. actually thrive. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you will lose things. You will lose yeah. relationships. You will lose money. You will lose uh, different things. But mm -hmm. that, but you will also gain. Mm -hmm. you, not to be transactional, but you will you will have a different community. You will have mm -hmm. a different set of relationships. And they will be much healthier. And, and if you are truly saying that you value equity and you value equality and you value human life and you value, if you say these things are your values, even the things that fall away are going to bring you closer into alignment with the things you say you value. 100%. So it brings you more into alignment with yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and sets a pattern for everyone around you. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a ripple effect. And when you stand in your alignment, your kids are going to learn that from the time they're small and they won't have to go through all the, what am I going to lose and all that kind of stuff that you're going through as an adult because they'll see you and they will stand in their values from the time they're small. And so they won't have to break away from those old norms because they'll already be living in them. 100%. And they will be correcting you. <laughs> if you're me, your kids will be like, mom, that is so transphobic. I can't believe you just said that. You know, you will, you will wind up learning from them um, mm -hmm. so much too. So I, I cannot recommend this, what you were talking about enough because, uh, you know, this is yesterday was the second anniversary of George Floyd's lynching. Mm -hmm. And then we saw this incredible uh, uh, amount of activism. And I was so, mm -hmm. I mean, to see young people mm -hmm. uh, in all 50 states, in rural communities, Amish people, you know, um, Native Americans, mm -hmm. people of all, and not just in the United States, all right. over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it was so 
I like just um I don't even know how to describe but the vibe it was I was so grateful and 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 um I mean obviously saddened that it right. took this horrible horrible series uh, you know, because it was in the pandemic and we saw mm -hmm. Ahmad Arbery, we saw mm -hmm. Brianna Taylor, we were all seeing it kind of together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but at the same time, I, like, thank you. Like, people are finally in the streets and, and united and demanding an end to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I felt bittersweet about it. Um, because I love that there were so many people that were out there that were saying that they don't, they they didn't forget, you know, and that they're pushing for justice. And then at the same time, nothing's happened, nothing's changed in our government and the way we operate, you know. And as much as I want to see people out in mass saying we didn't forget, I'd much rather actually have something change in our social structure. <laughs> Right? What does Ayanna so, Presley say? Uh, policy is my love language. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. So it was it was bittersweet. I'm glad I'm glad the world remembers. And what are we doing about it? You know, yes. the people in power. What are you doing? Yes. Exactly. How can how can we force the people in power to do what we want? We're in the majority. Mm-hmm. Well, I think what you are teaching people to do is exactly that, right? Earlier mm -hmm. this week, I had a post about white urgency. Yeah, I saw that. I reshared yeah, that. <laughs> yes. Talk, talk about white urgency and why why what you are doing is really an antidote to white urgency. Oh my gosh, yeah. Instead of urgency, I'm teaching sustainability. Um, what I what I see a lot when people want to work with me one-on-one, um, -on -one, uh, women will come to me, white women will come to me and say, I need to learn this because I've got a business product that I'm about to put out and I want to make sure that I'm not doing a cultural appropriation or I've got something coming up and so I need to do this or I just feel this urgent need to know everything now. And I'm like, like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I've learned this stuff over years. You know, even as someone who is experiencing racism, I've learned this stuff over years and you're not going to be able to learn it in a couple of weeks. However, I can give you a crash course, but it's going to be intense. Are, are you up for that? You know, and they always say yes. They always like, yes, I, I am. I know it's going to be hard and I'm ready. And then even, even with my embodied approach, you know, and doing the self-care, breathe to get in your body. You know, we're going to meditate for a minute. I need you to like hear my words, you know, without without feeling accused because I'm teaching you facts. And inevitably they cry mm -hmm. because they're like, this is too much. This is too much emotionally. I can't handle it. And <laughs> excuse me. And then they go from from crying and feeling bad to, you know what? We are all like embodied spirits and in the spirit world none of this matters and i'm gonna go you know this spiritual route and i gotta go wait a minute <laughs> and pull them back in and say you know what you're absolutely right and if you are doing the work on the spiritual level and you are not bringing it down into this body and doing the work you know on this 3d plane then you are not doing the work mm -hmm. and so so then we have this conversation and then and then what happens is um They'll, they'll get overwhelmed. Like I've had women who said, I need to learn. I'm a social media presence. I need to, you know, talk about equity. I want to do a project with you. And I start teaching and then they get overwhelmed. They do the spiritual thing. And then they say, I, I need, I need a mental and emotional break. I know I've been working with you for two weeks, but I need a month off because I, I can't handle this, you know, and then they'll go take their break and they may or may not come back. Most of the time when people tell me when white women come to me and want to work with me and then they say, oh, I really need to know and I need to learn. And then, you know, even with the embodiment and everything, they say, this is too much information and I don't know that I can handle it. I'm going to go do something that's not quite so stressful. Mm. And I'm like, okay, so you see the problem. I'm giving it to you as gently as I can, but in the way that you asked for it, and it's still too much for you and you're choosing to walk away. That is not an ally, definitely not solidarity, mm. it, which is why uh, when people come to me like this, I encourage them to, you know, join the membership so you can learn in community so that you can learn this in a sustainable way so that you're not trying to take in all the information at one time. 
but you're getting it, you know, in doses so that you can expand your capacity, expand your comfort zone, get used to taking in hard information, understand the concepts from the, as the foundation, learn, learn like our history. I have a, a course that I teach about um, how white supremacy was made the invisible norm. You know, and I'm basically going through through our history of how how racism and white supremacy was embedded in colonial law, mm. and now it's a social norm, and people don't want to see it. You know, and then the people who do see it are like, I don't know what to do about it. Well, what yeah. we do is change the social norms by enough people speaking up, understanding that equity is not just a value; it's something that you do, it's something that you live. Mm. You know, it's learning how to spot oppression. And then being willing to say, hey, that, that's not right. Not not necessarily to go, you're a bad person because you're doing this and you don't start an argument, but to notice it and go, oh, you know what? Last month, I might not have noticed this, but I see this and I recognize it for what it is. Let me see if anybody around me that's going through this sees it. Do y'all see this? Do you recognize what's going on right here? Does anybody else see this? And then when people are like, what's wrong with it? You can say, you know what? I learned this last month in Inspired by Indigo. Let me tell you what I see. And then people see it and they're like, oh my God. And then you're like, you know what, y'all? We can fix this. Mm. Did, did everyone just, I want to take a pause <laughs> and I want everyone here to drink in all of the wisdom Cecile just shared with us <laughs> and to see ourselves in, I saw myself in mm -hmm. everything that you were describing. I saw myself, you know, at the beginning, uh, learning about racism and feeling totally overwhelmed and, and then learning more that like every time I thought that I had finally gotten to the bottom of it and I knew how bad racism really was, mm -hmm. then I would learn something else and I would be like, fuck, right. it's so much worse. <laughs> like how is this, you know? And, and it is, it is like, I, I, there were books that I had to read like a couple of pages mm -hmm. and then set down. Oh. It was just I'll tell you the much. most recent one cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Mm. That one caused me pain in my body mm. to read that book. But I but I read it. It's it's a, it's a, it's essential reading if you care anything about about racism in America and understanding our caste system. Mm. Um, but it it caused me physical pain to read that book, but it was an excellent book. Mm. You know, highly recommend it to anybody. But I totally get you about only reading a little bit at a time. And I recommend that to, to you know, all of my students, you know, anybody in the community. When you get to the point where you feel like you're going to be overwhelmed or something, stop. It's okay to stop. You got to stop and do that self-care. I watch movies that way. When I watched 13th for the first time, I couldn't watch the whole movie all the way through. You know, I got to a point, I'm crying, I'm upset, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to watch this in pieces. I'm gonna turning this off yes. for right now. Yes. You know? I, I binge watched When They See Us because ooh. it was so well made. Ooh, ooh. You know, no, I could not. And I was, I was like, I by watch. the time it was over, I was like, mm. I was no. like, you know, just... No, but, I had to watch the episodes in pieces. I couldn't even watch, really? like, the first one I watched all the way through. The other ones I watched part and then had to process and bring myself back in my body. And then I'd watch another piece. Oh, my God. Um, but, but, the, but what you are offering is a community where you can stay in and build up the wherewithal yes. to continue and mm -hmm. to not disengage. And yes. As you, as you were talking earlier about why are white people so afraid to speak out, it really evoked for me, you know, so many of my mentors have said, go back and study what was going on with white people in Europe before they even came to this country. Mm -hmm. And so seeing these images of especially white women publicly humiliated and tortured, the entire town coming out and mm -hmm. clapping to mm -hmm. see them dunked in water repeatedly or drowned mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. burned at the stake or, you know, sometimes it wasn't like death, but it was like this public shaming and humiliation right. mm -hmm. of anyone who did defy the social order, who spoke mm -hmm. out, 
who was queer, who was perceived to be a witch. And that mm-hmm. before all of this happened, women had power. Right. You know, women were midwives mm-hmm. and and healers and, and looked to for wisdom. But as mm-hmm. capitalism took shape in Europe, women and this need to dominate them took started happening. And then all of that transferred to uh, colonial America mm-hmm. and reproduced in the laws as you were just speaking and then expanded to racism and 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 capitalist exploitation mm-hmm. genocide and 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 um land theft of native americans and yes. and how that became then the engine of it all and then white women's role in all this to reproduce and have the heirs and mm-hmm. and teach them in these ways and police yeah. the plantation so our husband right. can sign the declaration right because they wanted that adjacency to power Yes. Mm-hmm. And that adjacency to power provides provides a sense of safety. And um, speaking of that, the other the other thing is that even though it was like blatant back then, it's 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 a social norm now, and that's where like white women's tears come from. White women are the ones who maintain the like emotional equilibrium. So when people start talking about about things that make people uncomfortable. That's why like white people will cry. White women will cry because they're like, oh no, I gotta gotta maintain this balance. If I cry, that takes the takes the um um focus off of whatever we're talking about that's making everybody uncomfortable and then people will come and take care of me. People don't think this out, you know, they don't like think this way. But this is what's happening. White women will cry, the focus goes off of whatever the tough conversation was to take care of the white woman and then, you know, she's okay and then you can move on and act like the other thing didn't happen. And so when you're when you're aware of this, it doesn't mean that you stop doing it because you have to be conscious of it first. And then it takes a while to break yourself out of the habit because white women are trained from little girls to learn how to do this. Mm. You know, this is the way that white women are raised, whereas black women, we're we're raised to watch white girls doing this and then wonder why we're invisible (laughs) because all we were trying to do was be seen. And no one comforts you. Oh, no. Mm-mm. I mean, there are tons of videos out there where where Black women are calling out being mistreated. And then a white woman, you know, pretends to pass out or, you know, cries or calls the police and cries and lies, you know, but it's on video. So we see it. Mm. Mm. You know, white, white women's tears have power. Mm and have for hundreds of years the power but you know the power. but now but now people are filming it and showing how ridiculous this is mm-hmm. you know and then and then calling it out but that doesn't mean that it's like taken hold to the point where where the people who do this are self-aware enough to say you know what i'm gonna learn how to hold back my tears in this situation just because i feel like i'm in danger doesn't mean that i'm actually in danger this is one of the things that i teach and when i when i do workshops um before i even get to the facts after we do our deep breathing i talk to the white people that are in my session about the difference between staying in your comfort zone getting just outside of your comfort zone so you can pay attention and learn and being in the danger zone you know just because you're not comfortable doesn't mean you're in danger thank you Thank you. And and I think there is a distinction to be made between genuine tears of grief. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. I cried buckets, buckets mm-hmm. of white women tears. I continue to cry <laughs> them. You know? Well, crying and white women's tears are two different things. Thank you. <laughs> You. you know, white women can cry. That, that white women crying isn't necessarily white women's tears. White women's tears, like trademark. <laughs> Those are two different yes. things. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. T- talk about that. Talk about that because I do hear that sometimes from white women. Like I feel genuine grief, but I feel like I'm not allowed to express that grief. And I'm like, no, talk, talk, talk about no, no, everybody can grieve. Everybody has a right to grieve. You feel what you feel. You know, mm-hmm. grieving, grieving is, is 
one thing you know you're you see something and you're reacting um because you because you feel bad because you empathize you know but feeling like you're in danger or uh oh this this conversation is getting too heavy or uh oh i don't like the way this person is treating me and i want to and i want to assert my power or you know i want to make sure i put them in their place and crying that way feel, feeling fear but also not acknowledging the power that you feel when you cry that's white women's tears mm-hmm. you know white women's tears is a power play mm-hmm. White women's tears takes the focus off of whatever is happening and puts the focus on you so you can get what you want. Grief, you can grieve, but that's not taking anything away from anybody else. You know, sharing your grief with someone and saying, you know, this really hurts and I'm not sure how to handle it is totally different than I don't like how I feel and I want to change it and I want people to pay attention to me and do what I want. That's different. You know, when you're centering yourself to the detriment and the harm of somebody else, that's white women's tears. (laughs) Mm. Thank you for making that distinction so clear. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Because it is legitimate to feel Mm -hmm. grief and intense sadness. Mm -hmm. And, and, And when you start to think about all the ways that you have caused harm, that you have benefited from harm Mm -hmm. it's a lot to to process it is and you have to process your feelings because if you don't they're going to come out some other kind of way that you don't expect and might not like so you when you have those feelings you need to sit with them you've got to breathe through your belly and allow yourself to feel what you feel Otherwise, you're just like minimizing it and pushing it down. And it's going to either make you numb so you don't feel anything or it's going to come out in some kind of way that you don't expect and you don't want at a time when you don't want it to come out. (laughs) 100%. But Mm -hmm. if you can learn to build the capacity and the community Mm -hmm. and share that, you know, because then then I'll also find that that white women, we will tend to retreat and isolate when oh my gosh yeah yeah when you retreat and isolate then it just makes things even bigger and even um harder to deal with being able to be in community means that you see other people are grieving too and other people are learning the same things too and you're not the only one who didn't know and we're learning together and you can learn from other people's mistakes and you can find out that when you make a mistake it's okay because people are gonna make mistakes for human that's what we do if we were perfect i don't think we'd need to be here right yes right we are are joined by tracy j who is absolutely brilliant she says, I had to listen to cast on audiobooks so I could move while Oh, I- girl. Yeah, I, I totally get that. I, I read the book, but whew, yeah, I could only read a little bit at a time and I had to put it down. And I get moving while you're taking in hard stuff. Yeah. Yes. T- talk mm-hmm. about that. Why is it important to move when you're taking in hard stuff? Um, it's about being embodied. It's about getting out of your head. And into your body, which is why I start my lessons with self-care. We start with eat some movement or some belly breathing, you know, to get us in our bodies. We spend so much time in our heads and not in our bodies. And our bodies have wisdom. You know, a lot of times we're so busy trying to think and define what it is that we feel or what it is that we're thinking or find the right word. But if we would go out in nature, if we would go for a walk, if we would sit and focus on our breathing, our bodies will tell us, you know, and we don't have to have the exact word, but we can be like, oh, that's what I'm feeling. And you sit with it and you let it pass. You know, when you're feeling overwhelmed. Having a, having a good cry, you know, having a good cry releases some of that stuff. And then, and then, and then you can take in a little bit more because every time you take something in, you release the emotion from it, that makes space, it creates, expands your capacity and it makes space to take in more. you got to release. You can't just take in all the time. Especially right now when it feels like we, the bombardment of trauma is Mm -hmm. non, non, non stop more than we can possibly absorb. And that's what, Mm -hmm. that's what they, they want us to be like. 
oh yeah hold up tissues right yeah if you're if you isolate yourself because you feel bad and then you feel powerless and so you do less you know and then you and then you shame yourself because you're not doing so much that's the cycle that's the cycle and that's when the people in power have the most power Wonder. which is why which is why I don't watch um news on television I I like to take my stuff in like um, I like to read it and I like to take it in on my own terms, you know? <laughs> and then if I read something, I'm like, oh, I need to, to watch the video for this. I can go to YouTube and see, you know, what somebody said. You know, if I'm like, oh, I need to hear this out of their mouth. I want to see what their face looked like when they said this. I can go to YouTube and find that. But I used to be addicted to television news. And, you know, especially after the 2016 election for a couple mm -hmm. of years, I really was addicted to television news. It was like, I need to know everything. I got to know it all. And then it finally hit me that I was like in this, I don't know, like a panic state all the time. Mm. It wasn't helping me do anything. It was mm. not helping me at all. And I was like, you know what? If I don't know every single thing, that's not going to change a thing with the world. I need to keep up with the big news and focus on what I'm doing to counter it. Oh, <laughs> say that again. Say that again. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to change anything in the world if I know every detail about everything that's going wrong. Mm -hmm. I need to keep up with the big news so that I know in general what's happening. And then I need to focus on what I'm doing to counter it. Thank you. I'm working so in community, much. working in community to make that happen because my one vote might not seem like a lot, but my one vote with all the thousands and millions of other people that vote counts. You know, me knowing the broad strokes of what's happening in the world is what counts because that means I know what's going on. And I know how to take my next step. I don't have to know every single detail. Somebody else knows the pieces that I don't know. And when I'm in community, that means we all know it. Mm. You know, so I don't have to know everything because the person next to me knows something and the person on my other side knows something. The person across from me knows something else. And when we come together, we've got it all. Mm. So no one of us has to have it all together because together we've got it all together. Thank you so much. And that is exactly what Trump wanted wanted mm -hmm. he wanted our mind space he mm -hmm. wanted to be on tv all the time mm -hmm. so that we would be like he wanted to take over mm -hmm. uh every aspect of our lives and, and it wasn't he, just him he was the front man but yeah. it wasn't just him yeah yeah he was yeah, the front yeah. man and the distraction and the thing that kept our attention and the people who supported him that had power were doing all their dirt that they normally did in the mm. background, but they were able to do it even more effectively because we were distracted by him. Yes, mm -hmm. 100%. So you wrote a blog post last week that was so powerful, tying all of the various trauma that we are experiencing right now and U.S. history together. And could, could oh. you talk about that a little bit? You know what? I could, and <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna pull it up so oh, I can God. remember what I wrote. Sorry. <laughs> it was so brilliant. Y'all, so, so www.cecilearmstrong.com, um, S-A-C-I-L Armstrong.com. You got to You got to read Cecile's writings. Okay, you, you're talking about the one that I wrote after Buffalo, because on, on a lot of mine, I tie in current events with history. So I just want to be clear. Yeah, the one you wrote tying in Buffalo. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I said we're grieving because of racist violence again. And I talked about the great replacement theory, which is this you know, theory that white people are being replaced, that there's a white genocide and that white people are being replaced with black and brown people and that the Jews are masterminding this um, racial takeover by black and brown people and queer people and, and people that um, I guess straight white folks don't like. Um, and I talked about how, how that's not new you know, people have been saying this for hundreds of years. And I think it's funny because, you know, it's, it's a scientific fact that as far as we know, the first people were created in Africa, right? The oldest people that we know of came out of the continent of Africa. So we're all related back to that, that person, the oldest people that we know of. And then white folks are like, don't commit white genocide against us. 
<laughs> I'm like, but we're all related. So, you know, we if you do our DNA, if you take your DNA, I highly doubt that there's a lot of people out there that aren't mixed with something. You know, and um talking about the the whole thing about the great replacement theory, if you don't follow Michael Harriet, follow him on Twitter. He does an excellent job of explaining history and making you laugh at the same time. <laughs> Pointing like, out the absurdity, yes, <laughs> with all of the detail and all of the yes. Mm -hmm. And then the other person that I follow who does an excellent job talking about history and tying it in with current politics is Heather Cox Richardson. Um, oh, I know she's on Facebook and she also has a, a newsletter that she puts out. Mm -hmm. um, but she talked about the great replacement theory too. And she was like, it's based in racial hate, but it's not only about racial hate, it's about politics. And Republicans are using it now to create a one party state. Yes, and I will link to my interview with Dr. Elon Milwicky, where he talked about Henry Ford, the guy who created Ford Motor Company mm -hmm. was one of the leading uh, people who created great replacement theory. Oh, wow. It all established in the, um, you know, because essentially it's a divide and conquer strategy, right? Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you can get white people to be fearful of black people, there you then go. we will never form unions. We will never mm -hmm. uh, be united and you can oppress all of us and right. extract as much wealth as possible. Henry Ford was very, very, very anti-union. I, I knew he was anti-union. I didn't know that he was a like huge, per, what do you call it? Proponent. Proponent of the Great Replacement Theory. But I'm trying to remember, um, in the Seeing White podcast, I don't know if you've heard of that. That podcast is excellent. I use that to teach. But um, in the Seeing White podcast, one of the hosts was talking about um, someone, oh God, I wish I could remember. I can't remember. This is why I have notes when I teach because I can't remember everything. Okay. Okay. But he, was, he, was, he was talking about somebody in colonial government that actually said out loud that the issue was not about black and white. It was about rich and poor. And he was trying to convince poor white people that they had the same rights as rich white people so that they would hate black people. I mean, he actually said that out loud, you know, and and look where we are now. If people stuck together by class instead of race, we would be in a totally different, totally different position. But because they were able to convince poor white people that they had the same rights as rich white people, which, of course, they don't. Poor white yeah. people don't. And and if poor, poor middle class white people think that they're going to be safe. They won't. You, they, they're not going to target you first. But when they're done targeting everybody else, they're going to want what you have, too. <laughs> 100 and percent. And white women, we th we think, oh, as long as we're with the white man who's going to protect us from the subhuman predatory black mm. man, we're going to be safe. But we won't. No. Because the subhuman predatory black man is not coming for us. The white man is. There is no subhuman predatory black there man. The no myth was created for control. It's, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, 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 um, it's the white wealthy people in power that are trying to force white women to have babies. Yes. They're the ones that are taking your bodily autonomy, not black folks. And they're saying it out loud that they're trying to do force people to have babies because they want more white babies. I mean, they, they've said this out loud. I can't remember. It was the senator from Louisiana. Can't remember his name. Just last week said something about um, if you cor if you correct for race, then the maternal mortality rate in the United States is on par with everybody else. And whatever reason that more black women are dying in childbirth, whatever those reasons are, you know, I don't know what they are, but if you correct for race, then our maternal mortality rate is the same as other countries. And I was like, so he's saying that black women are not the correct race to care about, mm -hmm. you know, if we die in childbirth, how do you correct for race? Either we're human or we're not. Either we're American or we're not. And he was basically saying we're not. And this is a U.S. senator 
from Louisiana. From Louisiana, the state with the highest maternal mortality rate, 58.1 women die per every 100,000 births in Louisiana. They have the highest maternal mortality rate of any state in the United States. And that was his comment. Mm. You American women, we have the least life expectancy among all the wealthy countries. Our, mm -hmm. our life expectancy is going down. Prior mm -hmm. to the pandemic, black women's life expectancy was actually going up. Mm -hmm. White women's life expectancy was going down. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's about the, they think it's because of the sense of community that black women have and, and black women's self-care practices and community care practices are helping them to live longer. Um, whereas white women, we're dying of the same things that that um, white men are dying of: oh, wow. alcoholism, mm -hmm. overdose, suicide, et cetera, et cetera. Just these deaths of despair. Wow, and you know that that makes me sad. And that's what happens when you don't face what needs to be faced when you're running away from the problem instead of sitting with and figuring out the problem and figuring out what to do about it. You know, our, our country, our foundation is rotten. Our foundation, our foundation is rotten. If you had a rotten foundation on your house, what are you going to do? You're going to fix it, right? So we have a rotten foundation in our country and we're arguing about whether or not to fix it and whether or not it's actually rotten. <laughs> And we're, we're saying teaching that it's rotten is forbidden. We can't right. even talk about it. We just got to go on living in it and putting up more and more guns around it mm -hmm. um, to try and preserve it as opposed to facing the fact that it is something that none of us can stand on. Right. Well, they don't want to teach it. They don't want to teach the facts because if you teach kids the facts at a young age, they're going to question why are things like this? Kids are going to question and they're going to point out that they know right from wrong and then they're more likely to do something about it. But if you wait until people are older, if you wait until they're, you know, college age, wait until they're adults and they already have families, then they learn about it then, then they're going to feel defensive and then they're going to feel like they have no power and they can't do anything and they're going to fight you on it. So and they don't want people learning at a younger age. Yes. Their self-interest is all wrapped up in it. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, now I got to get a good job. And I got to uh, get a mortgage. I got to buy a house. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. care about equity. I want to maximize my returns. I my My family didn't own slaves. My family was poor, so I don't have to do anything about this. I'm just going to reap the benefits right now. <laughs> And pretend like what happened before, you know, didn't happen. Like I'm not, I'm, I, I didn't benefit from slavery back then. And even though I benefit from it now, I'm going to act like I don't. But, but everyone, did you just drink in all the wisdom Cecile dropped, dropped on us just now? Like it is about controlling the young minds. It's mm -hmm. always been about controlling the young minds because they will change things. All social movements for progress are led by the youngest people. Mm -hmm. And it's not like young people can't be racist because there are plenty of young people out there who are, you know, who have already drunk the Kool-Aid and they are in it. They are in it to win it, to, you know, fight for the, fight for the white race. Mm -hmm. um, but, or and, not but, and, if we taught true history, from elementary school, because, you know, you hear people say, if my child can experience racism, your child can learn about it. So that's true. So if we started teaching in elementary school, started teaching our history the way it is and not deifying the people who founded the country and who had power. And instead of teaching that, you know, they are infallible, never made a mistake, start teaching, start teaching everything saying, yeah, they did this and this was good. And they owned slaves and wanted to keep their slaves. And, you know, they were fighting for power using black bodies, you know, and all of these other things. If you start, if you teach the full thing, kids are going to question and they're not going to grow up thinking, 
you know, hey, how, how can I use this to my, how can I use this to my benefit for the rest of my life? <laughs> and kids can <laughs> handle it. Okay. Yes, they my, can. I'm adopted and my parents never hid from me that I was adopted. From the time mm -hmm. I could talk, they told me I was adopted. Mm -hmm. And so it was normalized, right? I never had this like deep shame or sense of inferiority about being adopted. Mm -hmm. And same thing, when when I was raising my kids, I started talking to them about white supremacy, slavery, Native American genocide, et cetera, from the time they could talk. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like then there was this grand reveal of how terrible <laughs> everything <laughs> is and they got totally right. overwhelmed. Kids ha are very resilient. Mm -hmm. It did not ruin their childhood. They did mm -hmm. not get all depressed and like des de become despondent. Mm -hmm. They understand how things actually operate. They have their own analysis mm -hmm. and they're able to teach and, and persuade me of things, you know, because they understand things. Mm -hmm. they, they built their own analysis. Yeah. Yeah, this idea, this idea that teaching facts, you can't teach facts because white folks feelings are going to be hurt. It's just absurd to me. I don't I don't get it. It's like, I'm going to allow people um, to be mistreated to be legally mistreated, marginalized, you know, abused to die because I don't want to feel bad that I heard about it. And I'm, I'm going to share something with you because because saying that just brought it up. Okay, um, I think it was last year. I was doing a workshop um, for a church and this, this was not too long after George Floyd's murder. And um, after I go through, go through the lesson, um, the, the church was mostly white. The members who showed up were mostly white. This woman, this white woman tells me afterwards, cause I was giving them like practical advice on what to do if, if something happens. Like, you know, if you see, if you see a black person or another person of color being stopped by the cops and you're like, Ooh, what does that stay? Stay in witness because your presence, you know, could derail something that might go off, you know, record with your phone because then if something happens, there, there's a record of it. And I was like, you know, even if you don't feel comfortable to pro approach and ask, you know, whatever, just, just stay and watch. And, you know, I was like, and the other person will feel the person who's being detained is going to feel, okay, you know, somebody's watching, somebody's got me, I'm not going to, you know, disappear and die anonymously or whatever. And so this woman was like, I, I'm not comfortable with that. And she was like, because I might see something, you know, dangerous and I might, I might see something harmful and I, I don't want to see somebody get beat. And, and she was like, and I definitely don't want to see somebody get killed. And I was like, and the person who's being detained doesn't want to get beat and doesn't want to get killed. And I was like, and are you telling me that your fear of seeing something happen to somebody is greater than your desire to possibly stop it because your presence is going to change the way people behave rather than just being there. You, you staying and watching, you staying and recording is going to change how the police behave nine times out of 10. And if it doesn't, then the person who's being detained and harmed, they deserve to have that documented, right? And she was just like, well, I just don't know. I just don't know. And so she was centering her her feelings over somebody else's life, even after we had just spent a couple of hours talking about what's happening and what people can do. And I was like, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do with that. I just kind of sat there and just like looking at her and was like, I don't know what to tell you. I, I mean, I really just don't even know what to tell you. And I said, I'm already traumatized. I have been traumatized over and over and over. And I will be damned if I'm going to walk away and let somebody else be hurt or or killed or something when I know that my presence might change things. Yeah, it's like, I, I, I couldn't do it. But if you could, I, I don't know what else to say to you. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm not asking you to put yourself in harm's way. I'm asking you to be a witness. That's it. You showed up because you wanted to do something. And all I'm asking you to do is be a witness. And you're telling me that's too much. Mm. Folks, we are needed, white people. <laughs> we are the majority. Okay? We hold the majority of wealth. We hold the majority of power, positions of power. We are teachers. We are police. We are judges. We are all these uh, corporate positions, managerial positions. Mm -hmm. We all have agency and we have to stop 
numbing ourselves, blinding ourselves, our fear of discomfort cannot be greater than our sense of justice. And not doing something is doing something. Mm. You can passively support racism and oppression. Not doing something is passively supporting racism and oppression. And I, some, somebody on, on uh, Twitter the other day was asking, you know, Brene Brown. Mm-hmm. Okay, she made she made a, a post on Twitter and somebody said, can you speak to um, the anti-racists who shame non-racists? And I was like, non-racist isn't a thing. You're either actively supporting racism, passively supporting racism, or you're anti-racist. And they were like, oh, it's all been said before. And I was like, well, if you feel bad because you're passively supporting racism, what are you talking about other people shaming you? It's like, I don't, I don't get it. If, you, if you're not going to be anti-racist, if you're going to passively support racism, then why are you acting like other people are shaming you? We're not doing that. Yes. And I, someone else posted on LinkedIn about how this focus on white supremacist violence like Buffalo, then we point the finger and say, oh, that terrible person, I'm not like him. Right. Which most of racism is not that extreme mm-hmm. it is the indifference it's right the passivity it's the mm-hmm. just allowing this inertia to happen if and everybody not- if everybody in that boy's life that man's life he was 18 if everybody in that man's life that saw his racism had said something to him any one of them could have derailed it. If his parents who knew that he was having a racist rant did something besides take him to the hospital, which let him go. If the hospital had held him, if the school had done something other than tell his parents who didn't do anything, if anybody who saw his list online had done anything, you know, it's, it's the passivity, you know, it, and, and this is the thing. This I said this, I don't know, a couple of days ago, I was like, you know what? White women, I don't, white men, I don't think are going to be like the tipping point. I think it's going to be white women that are going to be the tipping point to make this change. Okay. So white women, if you piss off your husband, your son, your nephew, your uncle, you know, your brother, because you won't let this topic go because you want to talk about oppression, because you want to call them out when they're saying and doing um, racist, homophobic, xenophobic, misogynistic stuff. If you if you go ahead and piss them off and make them talk about it, if you learn the facts and every time they say something, you go, you know what? That's not true because I learned this. You know, here's where this comes from. You know, that's a racist term and here's the history on that. If you keep doing that, then they're going to have to listen to you. And for you, it's an uncomfortable conversation. You know, it's it's getting comfortable with saying things that people don't want to hear. For somebody else, it's their life. Mm-hmm. You know? And I will risk having uncomfortable conversations to save somebody's life. I don't even know whose life it might save. But me calling somebody out going, you know what? I don't, I, are you saying that to piss me off? Or are you saying that because you believe it? That's the first thing. <laughs> it's like, if you're trying to piss me off, it's not, I'm not going to go there. But if you're saying this because you believe it, come here and sit down. Let me, let me tell you something. I'm going to show you something. You know? And it doesn't have to be so confrontational. It could just be like that. You know what? That's not true. Come here. Let me tell you the truth. Let me show you. And I think what you are saying, um, Cecile, is actually more transformational because when when a lot of uh, white anti-racist allies will get into that flame throwing and and you're bad and and that just causes everything to to crumble. But yeah, I see that a lot. That, that, oh, I know this. Let me tell you. I know. I've been around enough Black people and I've learned my anti-racism. So let me teach you. <laughs> and, and it's like, that's just going to piss people off. Be like, do you really believe that? Come here. Come here. I'm going to show you some facts right here. And, Ooh. you know, it's going to be hard, but I need you to sit here and listen to me. And then the next time they do it, they're like, wait a minute. Didn't I just tell you yesterday how, where this came from? Let me show you again. And you just keep mm-hmm. keep doing that. It doesn't have to be like, you're so bad. It's like, wait a minute. You just don't even know the truth. Come here. Yes, because <laughs> shame is the master's number one tool, mm-hmm. right? Making mm-hmm. people feel terrible about themselves mm-hmm. then creates this need to make them feel good about themselves mm-hmm. and, and leads to this superiority and domination 
mm-hmm. a need for control. Mm-hmm. Now, I will say, I don't coddle people about their feelings, though. Mm. You know, I, I don't coddle people and be like, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. Mm. And it's going to be so smooth. I'm like, wait a minute. This is going to be hard stuff to hear, but you need to hear the truth. Mm. I'm not going to let you get away with believing in this ignorant mess. And I'm going to tell you the truth. And I need you to listen. You know, so I'm not coddling people like, oh, I'm never going to hurt your feelings and you're never going to feel bad about this. But it's like, I'm not telling you that you're less than. I'm not telling you that you're worthless. If I thought you were worthless, I wouldn't even try to teach you. Mm. So let me tell you something. Thank you. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Everyone drink in Cecile's wisdom. <laughs> um, join us next week. We have Sima Lieberman is going to be on. Sima's been uh, involved in this since she was part of the Young Patriots in um, in New York City growing mm-hmm. up. And uh, yeah, really, really amazing guest. As we start to wind down today, Cecile, what is... Uh, How can, uh, what is one thing you wish white people would either start doing or stop doing? Oh, okay. Um, One thing, oh, one thing that I wish they would start or stop doing. One thing that I wish white people would start doing Mm. is getting in your body so you can manage your own emotions. Mm. Um, and, and if you don't mind, we can breathe for a second right now. Yes, let's do it. Because <laughs> okay. we did talk about a lot of stuff. So I am inviting you right now to breathe with me. Sit up straight so that your belly has room to expand. Notice where your shoulders are. If they're up by your ears, lower them down. All right. Notice how your jaw feels. Are you holding tension in your jaw or somewhere in your face? You can wiggle it out. Notice, close your eyes, and then just pay attention to your body and notice where you're holding tension. And I want you to breathe into that space where you're holding tension. And on the exhale, just let that part of your body relax. And now I want you to focus on your belly. Make sure that your tummy is relaxed. And then take in a deep breath breath through your belly and then at your own pace go ahead and exhale now let's take in another deep belly breath and then again at your own pace go ahead and exhale And with your eyes still closed, I want you to notice the shift in your body. Notice how you slow down a little bit. Notice how you feel in your body, if that's changed at all. Let's take one more deep breath. And exhale. And then you can open your eyes. And just taking that minute to just breathe gets you in your body, gets you out of that like defensiveness, gets you grounded so that you can hear things that might be hard to hear. And so I'm inviting you to stop and take a breath throughout the day when something starts to bother you, when you hear something you don't like, or when you start thinking, oh my God, they're trying to make me feel bad because I'm white. Nobody's trying to make you feel bad because you're white. That doesn't do us any good. We want you to get the facts so that you can start to behave differently and create equity. Making white folks feel bad doesn't do anything. We don't want that. You know, when you start feeling that way, pause and breathe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cecile. I feel so much calmer and more present Mm -hmm. um, as a result of that. Thank you so much. How can people uh, engage with you? Oh, okay. Um, you can see on the screen, my handle is at the real Cecile. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, um, and you can find me at my website. It's my name, Cecile Armstrong, S-A-C-I-L Armstrong.com. And there you'll find um, my community inspired by Indigo. You find my, my blog. And when I'm running a class, you'll find that all there. 
Excellent. And I am inspired by Indigo. I wore this. <laughs> <laughs> I wore this for you, Cecile. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. Um, it's such an honor, uh, Cecile, uh, to listen to your wisdom. Grateful to everyone who tuned in and see you next week on Collect Our Cousins. Thanks for having me. Bye.